So here we look at this great archaeological discovery, Egypt. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's Merenpeta Stele. The Merenpeta Stele is dated back to 1200 BC. This actually means mentions the children of Israel and also shows that the Egyptians at that time were not mainly black. You just have to get a closer up look of, of it. Uh, obviously, if these were black, they'd have blackened skins. And I can make it bigger or not. See if I can go back and see if it's bigger. Oh, go, go the other way. <clears throat> Made the screen a little bit bigger. Probably going to have to go online and spell that name properly and get bigger pictures through Google or wherever. There it is. See? It's even bigger. These are not Negroid. And they mention the Israelites as well. Well, you see now the following. Berlin Pedestal. The Berlin Pedestal may be the oldest archaeological discovery that mentions Israel. This was from the 1400s BC and shows three Israelite captives. <clears throat> These three here. Kind of get their features. The children of Israel were captives of the Egyptians for the first half of that century. Anyway, the three enslaved males are not black, but have more of a Caucasian Middle Eastern appearance. Take a look again. See? That evidence is also consistent with the view of most modern scholars who consider that the Jews are from a Mediterranean branch of Caucasoids. The following is from the 9th century BCE, Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. Israelite King Jehu bowing before Shalmaneser III. Note that the hair and beard <coughs> of the bowing king, Israelite king, is consistent with being Caucasoid and not Negroid or Mongoloid. Note that the hair, okay, now consider also the following. Some scholars have decided to test the validity of the claim that there exist Jews of African descent. Parfit came to the conclusion that the Limba people of Zimbabwe may have some connection to ancient Jewish populations based on historical and anthropological research. Moreover, a geneticist named Trefor Jenkins found that the Lambas had 50% Y chromosomes that were Semitic in origin and 40% Negroid. So this test seems to verify the existence of Jews of Af African descent. Though this may have seemed to confirm the Hebrew Israelites' claim, it implies only that those who can trace their heritage to the Limba are likely ethnically Jewish. Contrarily, the Falashas of Ethiopia, whom the black Hebrew Israelites used to prove their validity, were proven to have no biological connection to the ancient biblical Israelites through genetic testing. Therefore, the myth that the son of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba became the first king of Ethiopia conflicts with the available scientific evidence. Okay, let me just paragraph this off over here. Thus, the reader should conclude that unless one can show that all African Americans originate from the Lemba tribe, Hebrew Israelites have no basis for the claim that all African Americans are descendants of the ancient Hebrews. It is false to see reason that the existence of some African Hebrew descendants proves the claim that all African Americans are Israelites. Let's now let's look at some scripture. The precious sun's lamentations of Zion. Her Nazarites were brighter than snow and whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies, like sapphire in their appearance. Now their appearance in black is blacker than soot. They go unrecognized in the streets. Their skin clings to their bones that has become dry as dry as wood. Lamentations 4, 2, and 7, 8. The above is saying that they were very, they were very white, but after the disaster, they would be unrecognizable. It brings to some, something, in mind something about Job. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took himself, he took for himself a potsherd which 
with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Notice what Job, Job later said. My skin grows black and falls from me. My bones burn with fever. Job was not black or would not have said that. But with his affliction and the ashes, as he said the previous group of people, he said he was skin was growing black. You can't grow from black to black. That's what I'm looking at here. Maybe you missed it. All right. Job lived in Uz, Uz, the land of Uz, Job 1 1, which is in an, the an, an arena area, an, uh, which is the area, an area near Ur of the Chaldees, which is where Abram was from. Now, various ones, like the late Raymond McNair, believe that Job was the builder of the Great Pyramid and that historical evidence shows that his daughter was blonde and white. Well, we don't know about the period. Notice something about that. <clears throat> the pigmentation of the Egyptians was usually a brunette white. The daughter of Cheops, the builder of the Great Pyramid, is shown in the colored boss release of her tomb to have been a definite blonde. Her hair is painted bright yellow, stippled, stippled with fine red horizontal lines. This is the earliest known evidence of blondism in the world. Even if this is not referring to Job's daughter, but instead an Egyptian, again we have see evidence of people who were white. Isaac's brother-in-law, Jacob's father-in-law, was named Laban. The 19th century Hitchcock's new and complete analysis of the Holy Bible defines Laban to be mean, to mean white, shining, gentle, brittle. Laban's sister was Isaac's wife, Rebecca, and his daughters were Jacob's wives, Leah and Rachel. The name Laban would not seem to be describing a black man. The word Lebanon is related to Laban and means the white mountain from its snow. Okay. Here's another. Thus, it would make sense that the name Laban would have something to do with whiteness. David seems to have been white based on the following description. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes. <clears throat> ruddy means red or rosy. You can't be red or rosy and have black skin. Many people at this point to, many believe this points to David having red hair. Notice the following related to Esther, whose cousin Mordecai was one of the tribe of Benjamin called the Jew. Esther, a fair person. Now let us notice that Esther, who became queen of the Persian Empire, was a lighter, fair-skinned person. Let's correct the spelling here, I guess. I mean. She was of the tribe of Benjamin. He, Mordecai, brought up Esther, and the maid was fair and beautiful. This word fair is the same word that was used when speaking of Sarah. It means to be bright and is the only place in all of the book of Esther where this word is used. <clears throat> we, we, we read that Vash, Vashti, the former haughty queen, was fair. But the Hebrew word used here is a different word and does not mean to be bright, but it means to be beautiful. We read also of a fair young virgins, but the Hebrew word yafe is not used in regard to any of these women, but is used only in chapter 2, verse 7, in connection with the queen, Queen Esther. Let me fix that. She had a bright or light skin. <clears throat> Notice also, the Israelites were predominantly Nordics. Now let us go into history and also to the scriptures to prove what the pre-captivity people of the 12 tribes of Israel were really like. Professor Sachis makes the following significant comment. The names of the Jewish towns captured by the Egyptian king Soshneng, Sosheng, recorded on the walls of the Temple of Karnak, are e each surmounted with the head and shoulders of a prisoner. Casts have been made of the heads of by Sir Flinders Petri, and the racial type represented by them turns out to be Amorite and not Jewish. The Egyptian who made these lifelike engravings of Amorite prisoners from the land of Israel was Pharaoh Sosheng. What does Professor Seichi mean when he states that these Palestinian prisoners turn out to be Amorite and not Jews at all? By Amorite, he means they were blonde, a blonde Nordic type. He further states that David, let me fix David, was blonde and red-haired. It is plain that the Amorite belonged to the blonde race. His blue eyes and light hair prove this incontestably. So also does the color of his skin, which when compared with that of other races depicted by the Egyptian artists. At Madinet 
hebu, for example, when the skin of the Amorite is pale pink, that of the lebu, or Libyan, and the Masuash, or Messis, is red like that of the Egyptians, though we know that the Libyans belong to a distinctively fair complexioned race. In a tomb in the 18th dynasty at Thebes, the Amorite chief of Kadesh has a white skin and a light red-brown eyes and hair. Note carefully Professor Sechi's remarks, as they have very important bearing upon the conclusions which will be drawn later. We shall see that Sechi and others called the Israelites Amorites, though the people of Israel were not Amorites in the true sense. The original Amorites were descendants of Ham through his son Canaan and were dark complexion like all of Ham's descendants. Sechi then goes on to show that at that time a line of blondes extended all the way from the northern coast of Africa east to the corner of the Mediterranean, then north to Kode, Syria, and that was only broken by the delta of Egypt, where we know darker peoples have always lived. So blonde Israelites called Amorites. These statements show clearly that these Israelitish Amorites were a blonde race. Now let us go back and analyze the statement made by Professor Seichi in regard to the campaign of Sosheng, the Egyptian pharaoh. According to Professor Seichi, and many historians give similar accounts, Pharaoh in his campaign against Israel took a number of prisoners. The so-called Jewish prisoners turned out to be Amorite, according to Professor A. Seichi. So, also, remember that a number of paintings, according to Professor Seichi, and other sources show that the Amorites were definitely a blonde race. Their features were more like the North West Europeans of today. It should be pointed out, however, that the pharaoh who took these Israelitish prisoners, called Amorites, was the so mentioned in Second Kings 17.4. It was so, pharaoh of Egypt, who recorded these conquests on the walls of the temple at Karnak. Whether these Israelitish prisoners were taken in the name of Rehoboam, or at the later date, in the time of Hosea, king of ten tribe Israel, the fact remains that the prisoners were taken from the people of Israel. They were definitely a blonde race. So Dr. James Tabor reported that he found hair of an ancient Israelite man in something called the Shroud of the Tomb. One of the more interesting, fascinating finds in this tomb, one that has not received much attention, was the preservation of a sample of Jewish male hair. The hair was lice-free, and was trimmed and or cut evenly, probably indicating that the family buried in this tomb practiced good hygiene and grooming. The length of the hair was medium to short, averaging three to four inches. The color was reddish. You have that website. You can double check it. Right here. This is supportive of the view that the ancient Israelites were, were not black Africans. They also were was earlier, they were, there also was earlier found braided hair of a woman at Masada. The length of the hair indicates that it was from a woman. The color is now quite dark, but since hair darkens as it ages, its original shade cannot be determined. The quite dark would indicate that it was not originally black, black, hence it would have been blonde, brown, or red. A picture of it in the above paper indicates that the individual, individual, Hair strands were round like calcasoids have. It was not flat kinked as negroids have. This also would indicate that she was not a black African. Now, some claim that she was not an Israelite, but most scholarly sources I check with believe that she was. Getting back to the tomb of the Shroud, it's, it is about 2,000 years old. There were about 20 Jews buried there. Note some information about DNA results. Microchondrial DNA analysis confirmed the locks of the hair were contextually associated with the skeletal remains found in local SC1, the haplotype designations for mtDNA analysis are population categorizations that have been used extensively in the past to infer, actually imply, population movements. The haplotype types for the tomb, tomb of the Shroud individuals are commonly distributed throughout the north of Africa and the Middle East through to Eastern, Eastern Europe. The tomb occupants exhibit a number of different maternal influences. The maternal relatedness of these individuals supports inferences, implies that this al kale Dama site was a family tomb which was in use in the first century CE. Hence, 2,000 years ago, those Jews of the family that were buried there were not 